point and the ball broke, it could have been a 3-0 lead. I mean, it was very close to a 3-0 lead for Dmitry Ovtarov, and it quickly turned around. But yeah, he's playing a very solid game. He's working as hard as, and by as hard as, I mean harder than anybody else in Europe right now to be at the top. So Lubo to start with the serve in this best of seven. Solid opening backhand, getting in for the third ball. Well anticipated for the opening backhand receive. Lubo brings it right back. But Dima creating the angle wide. It's another thing about his backhand. Not only does he have the punch, and he's got the pace. He can change up the placement so quickly with such little wrist movement. Smart combination, bringing Dima into the middle of the table. Now as far as advantages and disadvantages of being so tall, a forehand stroke is gonna take a bit longer to recover from. That's why we see players like Vladi covering the middle of the table more with their backhand. It's a more efficient game, a way to stay relaxed, be in position. And then obviously they've got the long levers of arms and legs. They can reach balls perhaps wide that a shorter player can't reach. But as you say, if they're out of that position, they've got to be able to move back to the right position for the next ball, wherever that's going to be played. But in table tennis, you, you see players of, of all shapes and sizes. I mean, uh, Deng Yaping, when she played for China, she was, she was tiny. 147 yeah. centimeters, maybe. Well, I'm still in feet and inches in England. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, four foot 11, that's okay. what I use as well. Oh, good. Hungry for that ball up near the net, but it's difficult when you're at the back of the table to take it from so far out in front, especially as the ball's on the decline. This is one of the many reasons core strength and footwork is so important to get to where the ball is at its prime spot for your best opportunity. Clever idea, short to the forehand. But finding the net instead. So with the first towel break, Dmitry Ovtrov with a comfortable lead. I hesitate to use the word comfortable, but a solid start for the German player. Now this is two matches in a row. We've had German legends, Timo Boll with a bit more history, but Dmitry Ovtrov has passed him by in the world rankings and on the titles head to head recently. A great forehand there. On the diagonal, a lot of power. We also talk a lot about balance and recovery when we talk about players. Watching Dmitry Ovtrov in training, it seems like a little bit less forward than some of the other top players, but still manages to generate a lot of power. He's quite strong. When we watched Timo play, we also talked about service variation. Here we've got a long backhand serve into the body of Lubo Jancharek. It's not the first time we've seen a few big opportunities for Lubo that have not worked out his way. The one in near the net. And after a solid start to the point with that backhand right onto the elbow of Dima, the ball comes back just a little bit slower, left out in front, and he's not there for the contact. It's always important, isn't it, to, to change the pace of the ball, keep your opponent guessing. If, if you're playing at the same pace all the time and it's coming to them, they don't have to think about it. Whereas putting a slow one in, you went round the, round the side of the ball, you know, it, it went slow and, and the uh, misread it. That's absolutely right. So many different factors to consider here. And that's another thing when people ask what's the difference between the pros and say top club players or some local, you know, in their country players. Change of pace is something that I think is very underappreciated but comes with experience and comfort. It's just a whole different mindset. Because, you know, sometimes people, uh, players win points and it's not the one who hits it the hardest. It's the one who's got a touch play and position. Right, we've got, I mean, Waldner obviously with some of the best touch ever has shown us time and time again, but there's still players in the game from Stefan Wesch of France to even Karakasevich. I mean, that really love to just change the pace and do something a bit different to throw people off, keep them guessing. Anytime they can't get set up for a comfortable shot. I mean, even Gavin Rumgay managed to do that against Timo Bull for several points. He did, he did, certainly did. So strong start to the rally on Shark is 
in the point, but the last few, I think we've seen a few points like this where he's played very well, but then a shot that seems a little uncomfortable or he's trying for too wide of a ball. It just seems to escape him a little bit. Back edge of the table, little fortune in the apology from Lubo Yancharik. By the way, if you have any questions for us, you can hashtag ask the commentators, send them in to at ITTF World on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Weibo, Snapchat. And the break comes right back. Dima with the hand in the air to apologize as well, but he's got five game points in the first of this best of seven match. Soft flip from Jan Charik. It is interesting to see how some of the taller players, yesterday I had a chance to see Krishan playing in doubles, how the taller players really have to be wise about their over the table shots, their forehand flips. It is a lot tougher to recover, but the reach advantage, over the table game. Oh, there's a back end, where did this come from? We've seen some rally continuing shots, some pressure, but this is a clear winner. Get him tucked back into the body as he's moving out to the backhand side. That was great, wasn't it? Went down the line. To add insult to injury, right? It's one more thing to keep in mind, the placement of that ball with the pace and spin. Oh, he celebrated early, but still managed to regather himself. You can see his fist clinched there, just barely pre-cho. Little premature cho action, and he's saved a few game points now. He's down, that's three in a row. So this is where we see pressure start to build. You can see it on the face of Dima as he tries to stay dry and use this towel break as almost a mini timeout to think of his game plan. As strong as Dima is from off the table, again, if he can stay in, I think it's gonna be a backhand and placement. But he's going for the tomahawk serve, so maybe it's gonna be a third ball attack with the forehand, who knows? Outstanding rally again. Dima's changing the pace. He softens it up to spin a few, and Lubo's right there moving all around to make sure he gets his shot back on the table. He moved well there for everyone, didn't he? Counter top spin, you know, credit to him. It's tricky when you have a plan on your serve and you get a third ball back. As a receiver, this is your job, right? To derail the server, make sure that they have to improvise quickly. Long serve and a big point for Dmitry Ovdrov after losing four straight game points. He takes and capitalizes on the last one. 11 to 9 for game one. Dima up 1 to 0. We'll be back for game two right after this. And we're back for game two. We had a chance to see some interesting new statistics there between games. The serve clearly more effective on the side of Lubomir Yancharik, the Czech player in red. Which is interesting as Dmitry Ovtarov has some of the most signature and iconic serves in the modern game. Nice change of pace. A little softer but more spin from Yancharik. Young Charik's possibly seen a lot of um, play of Ocharov 
on YouTube, ITTF at the tournament. He probably doesn't know Genter Oaks service. So maybe it's something completely different he's not sure of. Right. It's a lot easier for people to get their research done when you're as famous when you're the king of Europe. Definitely. Now, interestingly enough, if you watch Dmitry Ovtrov when he uses his serves, that tomahawk serve against a lot of players who are less experienced with his game gets a lot of people to dump it into the net, but we haven't seen that yet. Solid power and good placement. Lancharg's gonna keep him pinned in the backhand once he gets him off the table that far. I will say Oncharik's done an excellent job of sort of opening up the angles early in the point. I mean, he hasn't been phased, considering he's, uh, he's playing the number five in the world. You know, he's playing his game, playing his shots. A lot of pressure coming in. Solid move from Dima to move back into the table. When you recognize the ball's a little bit slower, this is one reason it's so important to stay cool and be loose. You're moving on the entire plane, not just side to side. And that point right there, it looked like once again, Jan Chark thought maybe the point was over for a moment or was a little bit satisfied with the second to last shot. And it cost him a little time to get back wide to the forehand. Big backhand. You can see his right foot started to step behind just a little bit. Again, that's a positioning issue that will cost him a bit of comfort, put a little bit more pressure on. And when it comes to footwork, uh, Jorgen Persson, when he was working with Dmitry Ovtrov, I said, what's the big plan? I said, Dima, what are you working on? He said, I want to improve my footwork. Interesting. Mm. But I, I think a player, no matter what standard they are, they're always looking for that little bit extra because they always think they can improve. I think you sort of have to, right? Even if you're 110 in the world playing number five in the world, you come into it knowing that you have a chance, no matter how big it is or small it is. Sort of an in-between celebration apology from Dima. For those of you a little newer to the sport, sometimes we see apologies even for contacts that might be slightly unintentional. Top edge of the racket, most commonly for edge of the table or top of the net mid-rally. <laughs> Fools him completely. Having a serve with such an unusual start is great, but the fact that you can put it anywhere on the table of any length, that makes it quite threatening. The concentration on his face as well, just when he, when he does serve, you know, he's, he's obviously thinking, right, what spin am I going to put on here? Where am I going to place it? And what am I going to do for third ball to follow it up? There is a bit of rock, paper, scissor element in the sense that what do I think my opponent is expecting of me? Where do I think they're getting ready to move? And how can I use that to my advantage? Little apology there, break off the top of the net. Lubo keeping it close though. You know that backhand serve, a lot of people ask where did Dima learn it? His father, Michael Ovtrov, it was 1983, was a champion back in a region of the world that has changed a whole lot in the last several decades. But yeah, his father was a very high level player. for the big rip from the backhand, middle of the table. I will say that Lubomir Janchark has played quite a fearless counter-looping game. But a lot of the details, again, over the table, establishing yourself early in the point. And as strong as that opening was from Janchark, played right into the body, Dima gives it right back into the body and jams him to turn for the forehand. Physically, we have similar, you know, we've got similar heights and weights out here. We've got similar ages. We've got two big guys that are comfortable looping off the table that are looking to pin each other in the backhand corner and open up that wide forehand shot. Really a question of who can push the other one off the table. A 
will break off the top of the net. That forehand flip, Jill, you and I were both oh, yes. quite surprised by that. Well, it was just the speed at which he, he made contact with the ball. This is one of the toughest shots in the game, and to generate that much speed with such little flexibility in the wrist from that position, very impressive. Just misses the contact, and Dmitry Obtrov just where he was in game one, up 10-5 with five game points. Of course, on the other side now, on the receiving end. And a quick escape, much quicker than game one, Dmitry Obtrov. Lays down the line. Game two will be back for game three. It's a 2-0 lead for the King of Europe. Stay right here. We come back for game three. You had a chance to see some interesting t uh, statistics out there, some more relevant than others, the unforced errors factor. You know, from a ball speed standpoint and from a service, those are the ones that caught my attention the most. Dima winning not on serves, not even close to the amount that Lubomir Jancharek is winning. And that means in the rally, his game is far more consistent as the unforced errors statistics also showed. Actually, it's interesting, isn't it, to see those after, after the game. To see where points are, uh, have won and lost. There's the power taking it early, just like we saw Timo Boll doing earlier today, right off the bounce. But this could be a very clear decision. Dmitry Ovtrov, the doctor of finding cracks and balls, he can diagnose a broken ball better than probably anyone in the game. Let's see tactically if we see a lot more of this from Jan Charik. And it seems, again, he's trying to take the ball early on the uprise. It's one way to try and force Ovdrov off the table. And of course, if he does top hit the, the bat with the ball, that's when the, the ball does have these cracks in it, doesn't it, Adam? It tends to happen a bit more, and there's the ball switch. Dima using the sweat from the shirt. Often he will put the ball in his mouth. Maybe he's made a change here today, use a sweaty shirt. Let's see, is it gonna be the moment? And the reason he does that is there's a layer of sort of chalky, dusty material on the outside of the ball when it's really new, almost like a preservative, if you will. And it does affect the bounce of the ball, gives it a little bit more kick. So the players want to make sure that the ball is quite similar to the one before in the way it jumps when it hits the table, regardless of the spin. Smart play, heavy spin placed into the body and it drops down to the knees. Dima can't touch it. Look at this one more time, a little in shallow on the table. He has to really lunge forward to get that ball before it drops. Yeah, he stopped it, he stepped in well there and, and placed it in a difficult position on the table. And the point before, not only did he do that, but he realized that the ball was relatively low when he got to it, so he took a little pace off it and kept spin on to make sure that the ball would go, you know, on the table. Mm -hmm. But when you have your opponent so far back, that's a great time to hit a spinnier, slower shot that dips down in front of them. It'll break off the top of the net, but the counter's outstanding. You know, we talked also looking at the, st uh, the statistics there about service speed, and they were exactly the same, 24 kilometers per hour, I guess, uh, for both of them. But that's the majority of the serves. It just goes to show you for players at this level are going to be half-long serves, pretty similar pace. Question of rotation, placement, 
a little bit more variation. Yeah, because they're not going to be looking, they might have an occasional fast serve put in, but not, you don't see that very often. Right. Level, do you? Some players here and there serve long a bit yeah. more. And I think throughout the tournament, we'll, get, we'll have a chance to see how these statistics change, how these statistics change with different players. Uh, the world's fastest serve, Asuka Sakai from Japan. You can see it on ITTF's YouTube channel. Just incredible, it's unreal. I didn't even believe it the first time I saw it. I thought it was fake until I faced it in person. And how was that? I don't remember, it happened too fast. Did you see it? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things, you know exactly where it's going, the longest part of the table, but it's got si so much side and topspin on it, I didn't even touch it the first time I made it. And he did it in a match too. So we'll see the long serve game. I don't know. Oh, well, watch out for that then. Yeah. So back to the tomahawk for Dima, down by one. The key ingredient outside of the serves from the last game, statistically speaking, unforced airs was about eight to four, I believe. So double the amount of unforced airs. You don't hear the term unforced airs too often in table tennis because you can usually credit the opponent for something. But Lubo did miss a lot of shots in the last game. You can see the wrist bend back on that last one. He tried to do a lot with that. Tried to play it to the shorter side with some inside out spin. Very difficult contact. Smart change there, bends the wrist back, plays it out to the forehand. Now, Jill, you're a seven-time national champion. We talked about the equipment you've used from short pips to anti-spin and long pips in your game as a defender. I'm sort of curious how much you improvise and sort of use your peripheral vision to see the opponent when they're moving. Well, I was a defender. Right. So I had a little bit more time to see the opponent because I was taking the ball that much later. But with different, using different materials, it was a different type of game. You know, I used short pimples, I used um, anti-spin, but that's when it was black and black. So you had that disguise. Um, and then I played with long pimples. So when the materials changed with the game, then I just tried different things. We just saw a winner there, 65 kilometer per hour shot. If it comes up on the screen, there's a reason for it, a bit more pace. That wasn't even a shot on balance. So imagine how much power he can generate when he really is set up for the shot. It's a recovery from the middle. Because he's leaning slightly backwards there. I mean, yeah. if he's generating forward, who knows what the speed would be. Right. So the best performance we've seen from the Czech player, Lubomir Jancharek, now with the serve and a four-point lead. Getting back that first opening backhand, when you hit it that hard on a receive, and you're close to the table. It comes back so fast, there's not a lot of time to recover, and it's been quite jarring, it seems, for Dima to hit the fourth ball as well. Very wise play from Yancharik. Big guy's soft touch. In over the table, leaves it short. And look at this, six game points for Lubo here. Checking for a crack in the ball once again. You can see the Nitaku sponsor right behind him. They're playing with Nitaku Premium here. Did he find another one? I think he has. If anyone loses anything, please tell Dima immediately. Backing of an earring, no problem. And it's the assistant umpire with the stash. So he'll be taking the chalk off the outer layer there of the ball. They'll probably hit one or two just to make sure it plays well, that there are no cracks in it. That's the third ball then in three games. Which is interesting because on the world tour, there used to be a lot of, you know, criticism about how often the balls are breaking and then DHS introduced a new and improved ball that people are quite satisfied with. I've had the chance to play with it. Um, but yeah, Nitaku also very well known for the ball quality. So it's a little bit different also. We've got some of the hardest hitters here and every hall has different humidity. So a lot of factors to what could cause a ball to break. Not to mention, look at the size of these guys in the game they're playing, right? So we'll see. Excellent counter serve comes long, but it's loaded with spin. 
So Lubos receive a little bit spinnier and Dima back against the ropes with a winner. He looked a little bit tentative as well, his receiver serve. So then he was able to come in with this good third ball. And we've seen a bit of luck on the side of Lubomir Janchark. He had a few early in the game. Dima a little break off the top of the net there. Still a long way to go. But it's going to be quite important from a mental standpoint for Janchark to take this game. And once again, the serve percentages don't tell lies out here. Janchark with a serve that takes the game 11 to 6. And he's on the scoreboard here. It's 1 to 2, the Czech player trailing behind Dimitri, uh, Dimitri Ovdurov. And we'll be back for game four right after this. As the players come back to the table, it's Dmitry Ovtrov who is having the longer conversation with his coach, Jorg Roskov. Dmitry Ovtrov losing his first game, so there's a lot more to talk about. Now, knowing Roskov quite well over the years, I will say that he's got an incredible relationship with the players. He's just not only incredibly knowledgeable about the game, having played at the highest level himself, but also just really knows the players and is able to sort of talk to them in a way that gets their best performance. So you don't see very aggressive gestures from him when he's talking to Dima. Dima's already pretty intense in general. Sometimes he just needs to be relaxed and confident, and that's when he plays his best. But then that's a good coach. A good coach has got to know their players, and what you can say to one, you can't say to another. So. Right. And as you say, he's got the vast experience as a player and a coach now with a very successful German team. It was almost a repeat of the point before. Jancharek getting the step around forehand from the middle of the table and countering it cross court. Generally a smart combination as it is the longest part of the table. So you can make up for the pace coming in by having a little more margin for error in the length back. I think it was game one where we saw the service error on a similar attempt short to the forehand. Very impressive for Dima. I think the natural thing to expect after coming in for a short forehand is deep to the backhand. Lubomir tries to play it behind the momentum into the body on the middle of the table. With that much time on the ball, I don't know exactly which ones are being marked on four stairs but it seems unlikely for Dmitry Ovtrov to miss that shot most of the time. You know, we talked about calmness and how Dmitry Ovtrov can get a bit tense at times, but this is true of a lot of athletes as the pressure builds. Very free-swinging backhand goes long from Lubo. This gets interesting, right? We're tied up. Um, instead of being up 3-0, a strong favorite by world rankings, Dmitry Ovtrov in front of the home crowd could really start to feel some pressure if this becomes a 2-2 match. Still early in game four, though. Yeah, it's difficult when you're playing in front of your home crowd because you want to do well, not only for them, but for yourself. It's and things aren't going all his own way. And to be, to be honest, uh, we both He's doing all right, continuing his ranking. Indeed. And he continues here with the service point once again. 
Heavy rotation, but the unpredictable placement for me, I'd say is a huge factor in the amount of success that Lubo's had on his serves. Rotation there. I still think we see a lot more of the reverse pendulum and the shovel serves in today's game than we did a few years ago. I feel like it's a little bit tougher for people to read the contact. Sometimes contacting a bit more behind the ball, a little bit more on the outside. Tougher to see if it's underneath or if you're brushing up. And here's a solid way to earn a third ball. Tomahawk serve heavy under spin for a second bounce on the table that forces a push back. It's going to be a very difficult ball. You won't see Lubo try to flip it too much. Once again, handcuffed with the push, earning the third ball at the back of the table. As far as comfort zone, when you realize somebody has a serve that's just consistently earning them points, sometimes you do have to take risks and go for flips where you otherwise wouldn't want to. No, that's right, because he, he has won quite a few points from that service, and he's got to be positive on his, on his receive, Lubo. Because if he plays safe, then he's in with a good third ball. For me, that last point was a big determining point in sort of the overall morale for the players. I think that last point, you know, and here it is. This is the timeout that I think is needed. After losing two points in a row, receiving with a push, when you get this opportunity, he's trying to loop it to the middle of the table. But Dmitry Ovtrov back off. It's a tough one to miss, and it's the third point in a row. So the momentum has changed, and we'll see how things go in the check corner. You can see the footwork right there, that the weight was very forward for Dima, that he was on the balls of his feet and looking for the opportunity to come right back in. And he obviously thought that point. You know, he gave the fist. Now my check isn't outstanding, but from the, the hand motion there, there was some clear conversation about the tomahawk serve. You know, when Dima does get in the serving position, we expect him to use it again because it's just been consistent. Until somebody has an answer, just keep using it, right? If it's working, you know, well, what do they say? I guess they say a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> if, it, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. There we go. That's it. All right, back from the timeout, Lubo with his second serve. The spin deception is contact in near the body. It's just been so effective against Dima, and it ties it back up at the second towel break here. I'm really curious to see if it is a tomahawk serve, what changes in the receive game. Sometimes a long push, if you can't flip, is effective, but Dima's moved over deeper to the backhand side. Interestingly enough, I was sort of thinking if he's that deep to the backhand, a long push to the forehand, but by the time he contacted the ball, he was on the forehand side of the table. So there's always a conversation about the toss in table tennis and the rules, but if you toss it that high, it still qualifies as nearly vertical. Oh, burned, he committed to the backhand on the runaround. What a shot from Lubomir Yoncharik to keep it in play and tie it back up. It's a groaner, Jill. It certainly was. What a reaction, too, in that replay. It was Matrix-like that he was able to get the racket up and around the ball. Dima not just with power, but placement, too. And the plot thickens. That hand signal, I think we're all familiar with that. If you played table tennis, when you hold your racket that high, you're exaggerating the fact that you thought that ball was a clear winner for you, high enough to take the point. And the power again in near the table. Again, the home crowd here is cheering for one player here very clearly, Dmitry Ovtarov. So no matter how strong Lubo's shots are, it's going to be a rare occasion that we get uproarious applause. You're defeating the hometown hero. Wow. Again, Dima off the table, just so much ground to cover, but really focused play from Jan Charik to get it back not just back, but back cross court. 
Three game points for the Czech player on the receive. Well, Jill, the plot continues to thicken, and it's tied up at two games each. We'll be back for game five. Stay right here. So here we are back for game five in what is becoming a real battle royale out here. Lubomir Jancharik from Czech Republic in red at the top of the screen versus Dmitry Ovtrov of Germany. And Lubo has won the last two games in a row after quite a dominant performance in game two from Dmitry Ovtrov. Again, head to head, if you look at their world rankings, well, we've got world number five in black, world number 110 in red. And Lubo, his best world ranking is 66, where Dima has been world number four. So, quite an impressive match for the Czech player. Surprised we didn't see him check for a crack on it. It sounded like a missed contact. Mm -hmm. Smart play again, a spinnier shot, a little bit of side spin on it, but placement from Lubo. You know, Jill, we saw statistics throughout the match that the serves of Lubo were so much more effective. His placement on the table with those serves is just constantly surprising Dima, not allowing him to get into rhythm, it seems. No, that, that's right, and, and, and that's what you must do. You must keep your opponent guessing all the time. Not only spin, placement, just so that not, they don't get in a rhythm. And for the first time in a bit, it seemed like Dima found some rhythm on that shot, was able to get in near the net and spin it very low from out in front. And I was thinking also about the change of pace that Lubo had been using the last two games, but Dima's been taking, say, a bit of that medicine and giving it right back, giving Lubo a taste of his own medicine. I think that's an important thing as well, that some players who are quite powerful are used to winning with that, but depending on who you're playing and what their tactics are, you have to adapt. Yes, that's right. And, and you know, Dima knows he's got to change the pace because he's, you know, his opponent's got long arms, long legs, you know, long levers. So he's, if he's stepping away from the table to put a slow one in is, 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 is great. For me, the most memorable, I'd say, highlight between the games was that last shot where Dima tried to go in for the backhand attack. The ball set up a little bit, but it wasn't an easy shot. And those are the ones that are tempting to try to just hit a winner right away. But sometimes you have to invest in the next shot, hit it for placement with spin, and then get yourself in position for the next ball. I mean, as we said earlier, it's not just about power. How you win your points, is it? Right. That forehand flip is going to be tough with a well-placed serve. Now, with all these, I'd say, elaborate serves that Dima has, his service placement, I mean, I see him practicing serves a larger percentage of the time than I see other players practicing serves. And again, a smart play to play it behind the momentum. Yancharik moving out wide to the forehand. Dima plays it into the body.
Strong use of a long push followed up with that slower spinning shot you were talking about, Jill. Yeah, and he's placing him in, into his body as well, so he's got to move around a bit more. When we talk about mental toughness, after losing two games in a row, being able to regather, compose yourself, and come up with some new tactics, that's mental toughness. And the same could be said about this game after being down 2-6, knowing that you had some momentum, and that maybe your opponent, the stronger player, has figured something out, sort of being able to stay in the fight, like in the fight, you're not defeated until it's over. No, exactly. I mean, I've seen many a game where players have been up and their opponent has fought and fought and come back and won. You know, it's just, you just never know until the last point has been played. I think you're always going to have swings and roundabouts. A lot of people like to say the ball is round. Hopefully. Right, that's, that's right, quality control. Dina's been managing to get the attacks from mid-distance. Once again, edge of the racket. And we did see the applause from Roscoff in the corner. He sort of raised his hands up a little bit after. That was pretty cool. Say it and it shall be. But when he held his hands up higher, it was like he wanted Dima to know, you're doing the right thing, that's right. Get in the game, stay in short over the table, open strong. But if you have to play spinny first, it's not a whole lot, you know. He's seeming to play very smart right now. Mind you, that's what you want, you know. Your coach in the corner, spurring you on, right. giving you confidence. That's right. Making sure you're being positive. Yeah, approval can carry you a long way. From beginning stages all the way through, even, you know, legends of the sport, world ranked number five, still needs approval. Isn't that something, right? We're all human. We are, and, you know, just a little nod. You know, from your coach saying, yep, yeah, you're doing the right thing. That's right. Hey, I just did that to you. <laughs> Gave you a head nod and said that's right. And look at you flourish out here. All right, so a four-point lead for Dima now. Check out the balls, make sure it plays fine. Pretty atypical in a rally where they're testing a ball. Would you say this is happening more often now? There's a plastic ball, balls breaking in the well, celluloid? Well, it's interesting, you know, we have, I don't want to get into it too much. Um, Nitaku is known for making outstanding balls. This is the first time I've seen them on a world tour event. I know that they've done a lot of European events and other things. On the world tour, the new D40 Plus is breaking much less. But yeah, in general, they are still in beta stages on some level. You know, it's been several years now, so they've improved. But with the new ball that they introduced, at least on the DHS side, it's happened less and less. But right out of the new ball, Lubo takes the first point, second serve here. This feels like the Lubo we saw in game one, getting into the long rallies, trying to play the powerful wide balls. I think the pressure that he's getting from Dima is a bit different. Maybe one spinny first and then the aggressive shot that's backing him off the table, putting the pressure on, making him a bit, a bit anxious to deliver a winner. It's an outstanding point from both players. Watching Lugo throughout, I thought he played it very well. He blocks, he moves around, works for the opportunity to get a little more time and then load it with power and spin. But Dima doesn't miss a shot, now has five game points to take a three to two lead. What a recovery from Dima off the net ball and 11 to five, he comes back to take his third game. It's now or never for Lubo to come back and send this to game seven. We'll see what happens, game six coming up right after this.
And we're back for game six. Dmitry Obtrov cleaning the table briefly. Now, I've talked a little bit about the ups and downs of Dmitry Obtrov, how he's handled pressure, titles he's taken. He started off this year taking the India Open, where he has been, I'd say, very consistent. Won it in 2010, and then again in 2017. So that was an excellent tournament that India put on, and Dmitry Obtrov is a king there as well. There's the counter, anticipates well, starts a stroke early, the racket head is up, and Lubo takes the first point of game six. <laughs> placement once again, the pressure and the placement, keeping Dmitry Ovtrov off balance. Well, he turned around and used his backhand from his forehand side, using a lot of wrist and placement. Smart play down the line, not an easy shot from the backhand. Haven't seen too many of those playing the line from in near the table from Lugo. This is another strong example of what to do when you get a high ball. It might be obvious or seem like an obvious choice to hit it way wide if you can. But playing it right into the body often leaves a lot less option for a player to get back, or get the ball back on the table, rather. <laughs> Strong backhands, that's the first two points we've seen now for Dima in this game after four points lost. Just a towel break, the way he walked off, it almost looked like a timeout was called, but that happened earlier in the match, and there's only one per match per player. Slow, spinny one again into the middle. I think you're making a few errors off, off that, Dima. Yeah, I mean, the more attractive shots, the big power shots, not always the most valuable as we've talked about, but such a big and powerful player using that versatility out here to break the rhythm earns him a three-point lead. Oh, an edge ball for Dima from a tough position, too. I mean, if that shot comes down anywhere else on the table, Lubo's the heavy favorite to win this point. Credit to the serve, reverse pendulum deep to the backhand seemed to fool Dima, put him on defense almost immediately. Very consistent, powerful play from Dima's backhand and then finally a forehand to finish it. How quick he transitions from the middle. Dima's backhand is quite unusual for a lot of players. The grip, the angle he comes into it at. Beautiful shot and what a rally. We got side spin from both players throughout here and Lubo stays very focused to pick the placement on the table. Again, a parallel shot going corner to corner with Dima that far back. And even the wingspan, Dima's a tall player. It's just going to be too tough from that far away. No, he played that the ball, balls well there and then got him out of position. That was really good placement. Every point now, I just feel like the stakes are so high. That last point for Lubo, I mean, he was at 4-0 and then it was 5-4. That's pressure. The opponent coming around the corner with all this power, not to mention the list of credits that Dima has. Olympics bronze medalist alongside every other title he's taken from Europe. 
think we remember the last time we saw that attempt. He ran around the back, uh, the forehand side of the table for the backhand and left the table wide open and Lubo brought it right back. Sometimes when you have that, you remember what happened last time and it makes you a little bit hesitant to play the shot. It seemed like he tried to find different placement instead of deep to the backhand like the time before. But he did leave the table open so wide, didn't he? Yeah, it's a very risky commitment to run around for that backhand. Smart placement. A difficult shot to the short side for Dima. Gets him within one point here. Now, Jill, when you're watching, are you thinking to yourself, as soon as Dima crouches, what would I do if I were on the receive? What's Lubo's best answer here? Well, I think you'll be looking when you make contact because it can be very deceptive. Sometimes you think, oh, is he going to place it there? Is it going to be a bit longer? So you've just got to be looking at your opponent's action and then you've got to decide. If you leave it too long, then, you know, that's when you, you have to play a slower ball. But you've got to be, you've got to be positive. And punished on that serve. The idea seemed right. It was deep on the table, but sits up a little bit. Dima takes advantage of the time for the backhand rip. Three points in a row. I think he read that was going to be a long ball and then, you know, went for it. So I can understand why Lubo did it, just to do something a little bit different. And the hand to the brow immediately as Dima misses that shot. That's a lot of short play. I mean, I imagined, I could feel that Lugo was wanting, at least I felt like I wanted to see him go for the attack early, but he was persistent on staying defensive, and it was Dima who actually went for it first. It's almost like a game of chicken in the opposite way, right? Who's going to go for the attack first? Yeah. Typically you want to, but very clever play and soft hands from Lubo. Ooh, misses the contact, gets a third ball. Not an easy one. But you would expect him to at least be able to contact it and spin it up. And that's such an uncomfortable position. What a great shot of the footwork there when he's back off the table to have to turn that sideways to get it. Well, what serve will he do this time? Seemed to be the pendulum. A bit of under and side to the forehand side. A very familiar receive that Jan Charik seemed comfortable with there, now has two game points and serves. You know, it was two years ago, the last time the World Championships was not a team's event, that Dima lost to Lee Song Su in Suzhou earlier than expected. It was a big upset. This would be a whole different level. We've seen a lot of game sevens for Dima, a lot of big victories under pressure. That's exactly what Jan Charik's bringing right now. Oh, after a well-placed spin shot into the body, tries to come around it for the inside-out forehand, and it's just long. Love to see that point again. I think Jan Charik definitely would not love to see that point again, but take this one. It's his second game point here with the serve. on both sides, but still Dima manages to take the point. You and I both sat up straight after that backhand, Jill. Oh, that was a fantastic rally there, wasn't it? A down-the-line backhand rip and then so much power. But it's right into the wheelhouse for Dima, who plays it back a little more on the body. Gets Jan Charik slightly off balance. That's a strong answer to a long serve. Haven't heard too much vocalization from Jan Charik. Well, he looks very calm and composed, doesn't he? Yeah, but the fight comes to life after losing two game points. Earns himself a third here. Oh! The fight is on both sides. You can hear the fire for both of them. I mean, it's absolutely crucial that Lubo takes this game to even continue in the tournament. 
And for Dima, he does not want it to go to a seventh. The home crowd here, clapping, trying to win there. Yeah, it sounded like they were. On. That's right. Will him through. Pressure with the backhand again, and Dima is the strong here in the battle. A match point for Dmitry Ovtrov after saving three game points in game six. We talked about a pat on the left arm. And Lubo clearly not thrilled that he couldn't take one of those three game points in this game, but an outstandingly impressive performance from the Czech player. And I don't think this will be the last we see of the 29-year-old. The 28-year-old in black, Dmitry Ovdrov, continues right here in Dusseldorf. There are the scores on screen. By far the tightest game yet. And there it is, Dmitry Ovdrov, 4-2. Jill, what a match. That was a superb match, and every credit to Lubo there. I thought he played really well, the underdog. But, you know, he went for his shots, and he played really well. Can't be thrilled with the result, but can't regret too much. Couldn't agree with you more. Really well played from the Czech player, but just outplayed by Dmitry Obtrov here today. Stick around. We've got more men's singles coming up in just a little bit. You're watching the 2017 Lieber World Table Tennis Championships.